Carrie and I grew up on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. We grew up on the Shoshone, the Eastern Shoshone side of the reservation. Uh, and there our mother had a trading post called the Fort Washington Trading Company. And um, it was in that trading post that uh, Carrie and I kind of cut our teeth on Native American art. Our mother had started the trading post back in the, I think it was about the mid to late 1960s. And um, she sold beadwork from all around the United States, not just Shoshone and Arapaho beadwork. Uh, the Native people travel a lot, and they knew that my mother's trading post existed. So when they would come through, whether they were coming through from Canada or Montana or Oklahoma or California, wherever they were coming and going to, they would stop off at my mom's trading post, sell her work, and um, then be able to carry on and go on to the next the next part of their trip. So we were surrounded by beadwork from not just uh, not just from Wind River, but from everywhere. And also in the trading post, my mother sold uh, other um, material from other places. There were traders that would come up from the Southwest, and when they would come up, they would bring Navajo rugs and sterling silver and uh, all pottery, all kinds of stuff. And so she had all of that in her trading post as well. And from a very young age, she had Carrie and I working in that store, uh, behind the counters and also in the office. Carrie was more attuned to working with customers, and I was more attuned to being in the back in the office. I and the, other, the other thing that she also sold the materials for everything, that like she sold hides and she sold beads and she sold needles and she sold all, all of that that these objects were being made out of. So that was basically my sister and I's like, you know, playground in terms of we were able to access all of those tools and and then make things. So I think from a very early age, both of us were not only inspired by this incredible quantity of beautiful objects that were coming through, but also having the materials to make those objects or sort of, you know, you know, uh, um, copy them or, you know, or have them as a springboard. And the other thing that um, my father, our father is a sculptor, he's a bronze sculptor. So the back part of the, the structure that we uh, grew up in had his studios in them. And he had a series of studios. He had his, he had a, the large studio that he built his clay structures in. And then he had, you know, a framing room and a forge room and a woodworking room and a, mold room. And a mold room. And that was a little bit, um, not accessible to us, but it was still very much a presence just because of his personality that he, you know, he, he didn't work well with having young people in his life, but his, um, but just having the presence of that in, in our, in our, um, upbringing, I think really influenced, it certainly influenced me in that, you know, watching when, him build. Yeah. Watching him build. Watching and, him being able to build basically anything he put his mind to kind of, for me anyway, yeah. was like, well, you can make it. And I think that's really one of the things about about being an artist is thinking for yourself and being, you know, like figuring out construction issues, figuring out, I mean, you're working for yourself, so you have to like figure out the business and you have to figure out the construction issues and you have to figure out, you know, it's the structure of your day. You know, you don't have other people telling you, you have to be here at a certain time and you have to. And so I think that our youth, just set that up for us because both of our parents worked for themselves and they were both very successful and, and they also thought and were problem solvers. And so I think that, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. We've, I think you and I have had regular jobs, but kind of young <laughs> yeah. in our lives. Yeah. And, uh, and then as soon as we figured out our own hustle, that was it. We were working for ourselves and always working for ourselves. And basically, my sister and I feel like we're makers. What we do is we make things with our hands. That's, that's the gift that was given to us and the knowledge that was given to us through watching our parents both being makers of their own. Well, I think I have a degree in painting and a mi with a minor in art history. And, um, you know, painting was definitely my first love and still is. I mean, I still love to paint, but it's a, it's a, um, I don't know, there was sort of this like diversion that happened for me. Um, one thing like growing up with all these objects that we did and, and, and the, and my dad being a sculptor, that sort of three dimensional object and, and also that three dimensional object that is adornment, 
and because that there's something very potent in i mean terry just said that we're makers of things and and it's not just like oh i'm gonna make a i don't know a afghan you know or i'm not gonna not that there aren't amazing afghans out there but it's like there's there's certain objects have power in them and and that's really interesting to me and and you know you have a painting and it that can be really a potent and powerful thing you have a sculpture that can be a really potent and powerful thing but something that's really accessible to most people is jewelry is personal adornment or you know clothing i'm not a, a clothing maker but for, you know jewelry held it for me in terms of material um people wear rings you know the ritual of a, a wedding ring is a really potent and a powerful thing and and you know you inherit a ring or you inherit a pair of earrings or you know that sort of the linkage to your ancestors the linkage of you know that particular gift the power that comes in an object from wearing it every single day that that you know starts holding your life story in it you know on on that sort of that level is is interesting to me and also the production of jewelry is fascinating to me i mean it's oh, it's constantly a challenge and i love that if it's you know it's like i i rue the day that i would make the same thing over and over and you know so for me there's so many different techniques in jewelry and the industry and the the tools that are being constantly reinvented and and expanded upon which demands that i continue to learn these new techniques and these new things is really is 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 it was that's why I think the medium just sort of fell in for me to that it became my right marriage. And I think that um, when Carrie talks about uh, when she talks about objects in terms of the meaning of them that they hold, that is not far from this the deep symbolic meanings that most adornment that we grew up with is. So when I look at a pair of moccasins, they're not just a pair of shoes. Those moccasins, traditionally made, have deep symbolism in them that goes back not just to the maker or the person who's wearing them, but to the history of the people that they come from. So you can literally read them. And so adornment, the idea of, of creating things that people wear on their body that have that kind of deep meaning that is beyond the personal, that goes into the historical, that goes into the human, all of that is, it's really juicy stuff. And um, as far as being a bead worker, obviously I came out of a bead working tradition. My, uh, my grandmother was a bead worker. She supported her entire family, including the grandchildren that she raised uh, doing bead work. She did not have a good education, and so it was the bead work that supported her family. My mother supported our family selling bead work and with her love of bead work. So I have a really deep personal uh, connection to it. But beyond that, and this is something that developed as I continued to make beadwork, because I started off making beadwork in a traditional form, moccasins and bags and all that sort of thing. Now, I feel like um, beadwork is a medium for my stories, and I'm not locked into the traditional forms. So what that means is, is that I do sculpture with beadwork as a medium to be able to further my story. I do two-dimensional work, and beadwork just happens to be the medium that I'm working in two-dimensional form with. So it's not, I'm, I don't get hung up so much on the medium itself, whether it's metal, whether it's gold, whether it's you know, plastic, whether it's digital media, whatever it is, to me, none of that matters, really. It's how that person's story comes across it, how they're able to use those mediums to help further that story, that's, that's the best of what a human being can offer the world. That's the creative process. And that is truly survival. That's how, that, that interpretation of new medium is how we as native people have survived into the future. Beads are not a traditional medium. They were trade objects. As soon as we got thread, you can be guaranteed that women started using thread instead of sinew, and it changed the medium. Now things are way more decorated than they used to be. The ability to use their voice through that medium is incredible because they have the new materials. And I feel like uh, that oftentimes with traditional arts that you get put in this little box of what should be and what shouldn't be, and I don't feel those limitations. I know that other people do, and certainly when it comes to traditional objects, which I still continue to make for my family, I put those limitations on myself. But those limitations, as far as 
me personally as an artist, I don't feel them. And I'd have to just respond to that, just to debate you a little bit. I, the word survival for me, because you said that's truly survival and I understand what you're saying, but I would, I would beg that it would also would be expansion and, yes. you know, and, yes. you know, the furtherment because it's right. not, you know, survival kind of has connotations. Right. You're, like you're absolutely you're right, Karen. Yes. Scraping the scraping the bottom. Right. And, no, it's it's beyond survival. Yeah. It is it is that continuing of yeah, that expression. The expansion through, uh, the through expansion the ages. Of, but yes, yeah. exactly. The living, the yes. livingness, the, the right. breathingness of it. Right. And the other thing that I would say that, that about like medium, I think at some point, like being a maker of things, I think you and I both make a lot of things. We make cakes and we make rugs and we make you know whatever we make clothing we make a ton of things but at some point and I, I would just say this because you know f for the young upcoming artists at some point you have to you have to pick a medium and you have to become really good at that medium right. and you have to express yourself through that particular medium whether it be beads or paint or you know ink or what or video or whatever it is in order to be successful at it and that's not to say that you can't express yourself in other mediums but i i um i think just to become a successful artist you have to you have to say okay this is my profession and then allow yourself to make whatever you want but that's your hobby then ever since craft in america showed up on my door like i know because of how beadwork is collected that the older the beadwork, the more valuable it is, irregardless of the technical skill involved in it. Only recently, within probably the last 15 or 20 years, has that started to change, where contemporary beadworkers are getting recognized through the value, the monetary value put on their work, um, in the way that the old pieces are, which is great, because that means that the medium now is being recognized as a valid medium. It was craft. It was considered craft, and not only that, it came out of an anthropological um, um, uh, definition of what it was. It was, for the longest time, if you wanted to see beadwork, you had to go to a natural history museum, right? So that shift started to happen in the 70s uh, when Native people became anthropologists, and they stopped seeing, they started to see these traditional art forms as art rather than as craft or ethnography, right? When I'm looking at a piece of so-called so craft work uh, being worn or used in a ceremony or a dance, I'm not looking at it as craft. I can read it and I can see it and understand it for all the deep meaning that it has. It's those people that can't read that into it that would see it as just craft, as a repetition of a pattern passed down from a grandmother or whatever without recognition of the artistic hand in that object, right? So um, that, um, that debate bothered me for a long time until I got over it <laughs> and realized that it, that it doesn't matter. I'm going to continue to make what I'm going to make, regardless of how people define it. And uh, because the medium that I work in beadwork is not, it does not have the intrinsic value that gold or diamonds or anything else has. It doesn't have the artistic history that sculpture or painting has. Uh, and it doesn't have the cachet that ceramics has, right? It's, it's this weird kind of... Well, craft is interesting, though, because I think, I mean, craft belongs to everyone, like in terms of like every ethnicity. And I think that the argument came when, when things started being mass produced. Because right. before, you, you knitted a pair of stockings and you knitted a pair for your son. And, you know, every year you got a new pair. And that was called making your socks. And then it became, you, you know, now you go to the store and you buy packets of socks and your grandmother knits, knits you a pair of socks and you're like, oh, look at the craft. You know, I mean, so that craft all of a sudden got elevated when mass production started. So if it's utilitarianism, which jewelry is considered a dormant, so therefore it's useful. Moccasins, beadwork is considered utilitarian because anything that's beaded is useful. That's the, that's the, that's the difference. That difference is slowly getting broken down as mass production happens, right. as big artists like uh, Damien Hurst or whoever has a whole crew of people who make his work for him and he just has the idea. The idea of the hand, like this Nakashima, involved in the object is becoming more important now. And I think it's in response to in the response, mass production. Absolutely. Right? And I'm noticing that in my work more and more is that... They want a one-off. They don't want a Zales, and, no matter how big yeah, the diamond is, right? And, and I, 
absolutely don't, you know, I don't want a bunch of people making my thing. I make um, everything I do because I came from uh, making things for use to be worn. Everything I make is where, like, could be worn if it's a if it's a wearable object. And my tennis shoes are no different. Uh, absolutely, people can wear them. Uh, people don't wear them, but they can. The only person that I know that has worn my shoes is my mother. She has um, two pairs of my shoes, and she's worn them both, and uh, no problem. The actually the beadwork doesn't damaged or falling off or anything like that. It's the rubber of the soles that are wearing out. So yes, I, I would love to see women walking around in my shoes because I don't know, they put life in it. You know, it's not just an object on the wall to be admired. It's something that's like brought into the world. Santa Fe is such a great place to live, especially as an artist, because you have this incredible diversity of cultures and, you know, you have the country and you have the, you know, the food and the, you know, it's like everything. It's like, it's really, it's great. And um, so it, And they embrace it just, their history here. Yeah, they embrace their history. In Santa Fe, they really embrace yeah. their history here that isn't just the history of America, right? And that is something that is just not found in any it's, other place that I've ever been anywhere in the United States. I have maybe in parts of California or so, but it's, it's an amazing thing because it feels like, it feels like when you go to Europe, yeah. Right. It feel that that's how Santa Fe feels. It feels like when you go to Europe and you're like, wow, the history expands back here past the Roman Empire. Right. right. Yeah. You know, it's not just the history of whatever country you're in. It goes that, and that's how Santa Fe feels. It's got these really long, deep bloodlines that just yeah. stretch way. That are the very, path. for me, quite present. They are. Right. You know, that's, yeah. Like that's it. You really feel very it. Present. Yeah, you feel it on a daily basis. I came here because my mother was here. I came here without an idea at all about the arts. Even though I had beaded my way through college, I had been doing beadwork all the way through college, paying for books and, and tuition and all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, had my own little hustle going on. And, um, and I came here with the intention of going to UNM, the law program at UNM, and I was all ready to take my LSATs. And then I did my first show at Eight Northern Pueblos. That was when Eight Northern Pueblos was still going on. And I um, came this close to winning their grand prize over there. And it was then that I realized that I could make money doing feed work, like pay the bills kind of money, not just, you know, supplementing my books and all of that. And uh, kind of just, well, that first year that happened, at that show and then I told my mom oh I should try Indian Market and she kind of laughed at me and was like yeah right Terry she said well apply she said but realize it's this competition is incredibly stiff to get in you're probably not going to get in you're definitely not going to get your own boost but try it she encouraged me to do it even though she had a realistic vision of it I managed to not only uh, get in but I got my own booth which I still am at that same spot and the following year I won best of show and when I won best of show that's when I realized that perhaps law wasn't my path, that, that art was my path. And even though I grew up in an artistic household, my sister went to RISD, my dad was an artist, my mom sold art, I just never thought of it as a career path, like a, as a way. I actually traveled to Italy when I was 11 years old, and I, we have many relatives back in Italy, in a little town in northern Italy called, called Fenzazzo. It's a little village. It's uh, near Como Lake. Um, and we are Venetian by blood. Apparently our family members, I don't even know how long ago, came from Venice and settled inward. So I, um, I got to know all of them. So I have this connection to my Italian blood um, through that trip and through knowing my cousins who I'm still, you know, communicate with through Facebook and all of that. And, um, and it's funny because if they were to say anything about us, they'd say that I'm the Oh, Terry's the ending and Carrie's the nut, you know, or whatever, right? But the thing is, is that I kept my Italian name. I kept that name because of my bloodline connection to those people in Italy, to my relatives, my blood in Italy. When I went over there, I was the exotic. Yes. And they trotted me out to everyone and said, this is my relative from America. She's Indio, 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 <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes, I was quite exotic. <laughs> we've never collaborated on work, though we've talked about it. Yeah. However, when I have a really big question, I call mm -hmm. my sister. Like if there's something that's like it's knocking around in my head and I need help, 
figuring it out. I call her. It's not and, very often. <laughs> well, I know, but it's like yeah. the big, the yeah, big the things. Big I, I reach out to you when, yeah. when I'm like, all right, I didn't quite know how to get around this one. And I know Carrie, I need Carrie's perspective on this. Yeah. So. I think that that's definitely a two-way street and it's it like I said it's not very often but when we do and it's and not that we take each other's advice always but it's it's that thing of having someone else's perspective and somebody who's who knows your who knows your history you know yeah. who knows not just the not just the the um professional history but knows you like Personally, intimately yeah. deeply like we were we were tutored at home when we were children and so you know, we were each other's playmates and we lived very rurally. So we didn't have a lot of friends and we really just had each other and we were like salt and pepper shakers the whole time growing up. So I think that created some bond that, that, um, that other kids who have a lot of outside influence ha may have a different con connection with their siblings, not only being from a different tribe, but being tutored at home. So we weren't, you know, and being half white and being half white. So there was like all three of those things kind of had a, um, I felt like an outsider yeah, my entire sure. life. I've always been, I've That's always it. felt like I've been on the outside yeah. kind of looking in. And at first it was like, you know, what the heck, you know, mom and dad. And then as I've gotten older, I'm like, yeah, this is a really good spot to, to be, be in. in. Yeah, yeah I is. really like being yeah. over yeah. here where I don't quite fit, yeah. you know, and that it's a good what, place to be. Yeah. I think you, you can draw you, strength from it. You tend to care less what other people think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it is. You're kind of like, yeah, well, they don't have to like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think um, I think it also, I guess, and this is a continuation of that, it strengthened identity. I really have a memory of wanting to wear, mom had a, a great collection of uh, women's clothing, native women's clothing, and I was like madly in love with this Yakima dress. I was just like, oh my God, this thing is so beautiful. And I wanted to wear it to a powwow. I was probably 12 years old. And mom was like, absolutely not. You don't have one strand of a Yakima blood in you. You are Kiowa and you're not gonna, you know, you will dress as a, you know, like, and I think that, I, that was just a really strong childhood memory. And I think that was that identity thing of like, we, you know, these are people who are our community and that we live amongst, but you are not Shoshone, you are Kiowa. And which is not, you know, which doesn't mean that you're not completely, utterly influenced by them, and but it's it's a um, you know it's a cultural, and I think that actually is you know something that that Terry and I still find because living living in an area that's Pueblos right. and the Pueblo culture is wi wildly different than the Kiowa culture, and when um, people come to our studios or people you know come and see us and they want to see us together, there's that there's a sort of assumption that that we're both starting to notice that oh you know, we, we maybe behave differently than the Pueblo's, Pueblo artists behave with their clients, you know, because it's just a cultural difference.